各位老师、同学，大家好！欢迎大家参加今天的讲座活动。我是主持人杨二茶，是清华大学的在读博士生。啊，本次活动呢，由极致和致源社区孵化的英国科学社区成员自发组织啊，并且由极致提供运营支持。今天的活动，我们非常非常的荣幸邀请到了当今世界上最具影响力的统计学家 Donna Rubin 教授来为大家介绍英国推断的工作。嗯，然后为了方便这个讲座，接下来我都会用英语再给大家进行陈述。Uh, dear students and teachers from all over the world and from the community, welcome to today's event. Uh, we are very honored to have Donna Rubin, one of the world's most influential scholar in statistics, to be with us and introduce the essential concepts for causal inference in randomized experiments and observational studies, a remarkable history. First, let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Donna Rubin. Um, he is the John Lead a uh, professor emeritus of statistics from Harvard University, where he has been professor since 1983, and also department chair for 13 years. He also holds professorship at the Yale Mathematical Sciences Center in Tsinghua University and Muri uh, Schusterman, senior research fellow at Fox School of Business, Temple University. He is the winner of Wilkes Medal, Parson Prize for Statistics Innovation, George W. Snedecourt Award. He has been elected to be a fellow member, honorary member of American Statistical Association, Institute of Mathematics Statistics, Inst International Statistical Institute, American Association for the Advancement of Science, American Academy of Arts and Science, European Association of Ma Methodology, British Academy, and the US National Academy of Sciences. As of 2021, he has authored and co-authored over 400 publications, including 10 books, and has four joint patents, and for many years, he has been one of the most highly cited scholars in the world, with currently over 35, 350,000 citations from Google Scholar. And we're also very honored to have three uh, discussant speakers with us. Uh, they are Professor uh, Zhou Xiaohua, Andrew Zhou from Peking University. Uh, he's the PKU Chair Professor and the Chair of the Department of Biostatistics in Peking University and Xi Liang Zhao, professor from uh, the Wang Yanan Institute for Studies in Economics and from Xiamen University. And also Professor Cui Peng uh, from Association Professor with Tenure in Tsinghua University. Now, with, without further ado, let us give a warm applause and welcome to Donna Ruby and uh, to have him introduce uh, for us the causal inference. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so these these slides were uh, created uh, a few months ago. Well, first of all, I, I want to uh, thank the, the organizers <clears throat> for inviting me, uh, and and um, I'm very pleased to be able to give this introductory lecture. Uh, uh, another comment that that's relevant uh, today, but that is is not relevant with was not relevant when I made up these slides, is that uh, uh, within the last week, my co-authors uh, on, on a uh, causal paper just got the, uh, shared the Nobel Prize in economics. It's Josh Angris <clears throat> and Guido Imbens uh, just uh, about a week ago got a Nobel Prize in e economics, uh, uh, basically, for work that's completely consistent with this uh, framework that I'm uh, going to describe here, uh, and actually both of them gave uh, uh, gave me phone calls the day that I got the Nobel Prize because it's uh, an impressive e event. So, uh, in in addition to being uh, this interpretation of essential concepts in causal inference, I think now it's pretty much become the standard approach at least in economics and, and parts of medicine. So I think it's uh, the talk is even more relevant than it would have been uh, of even a few weeks ago. Okay, so the, the title is Essential Concepts for Causal Inference and Randomized Experiments and Observational Studies, a, a Remarkable History. And uh, a couple comments about the uh, title. What I mean by essential concepts is ones that you need 
and you get rid of the clutter. So for uh, example, I'm, I'm often asked about uh, the graphical ap approach to, to, to causal inference. And, and in, in many cases, uh, other approaches than the one I'll be describing here can be useful for communicating ideas, but they're not essential. Uh, and if, if the, the sense of essential here is, is like the mathematical sense of, of essential. So if, if you leave out a condition in the theorem that makes the condition false without that condition, then that's essential. And if you, if you add stuff that's not essential, uh, so for example, if you say you have a um, right triangle and with two sides equal, so it's an isosceles right triangle, and you say the twice as the, the square of the short sides equals the long side, well, that's true, but it has clutter in it because you're, you're putting something in uh, that, that you don't need because it's any, uh, it's any uh, right triangle for which that's, that's true. So, and uh, why do I call it a remarkable history? Well, as the idea will be developed here, what you'll, what you'll see, at least from my perspective, is the uh, history of the formal history is very recent. So you, you can trace the intuitive idea of causal inference back for thousands of years. But the formal mathematical history is really, in my mind, remarkably recent, meaning it's, it's a 20th century idea that's related in some ways to another re, set of remarkable ideas having to do with quantum mechanics. Basically the idea that you can define two things each of which can be measurable. You can actually observe, but you can't observe them simultaneously. And that's the, what I regard as one of the essential ideas of, of, of causal inference as reflected in, especially in the, in the mathematics of the 20th century. Okay, next slide. So a, a, a prolinked causal inference is, is my sort of exposure to uh, what I regard as science. Uh, as a, as a kid, like, like many kids in, in, in high school, I was interested in, uh, in math and physics, but far more physics than uh, math. So when I went to college, I went to uh, Princeton University, which I entered in 1961. And the first physics course I, I took with, with, with a relatively uh, famous physicist named John Wheeler. Uh, John Wheeler uh, was, was a, uh, colleague of uh, Albert Einstein's. Uh, and so they, they were in the, in the physics department at the same, same time. And he was a, a also well known for, he's attributed to having made up the name black holes. And in fact, he, he denied that he was giving a lecture at one point in time is describing something that, that has so much uh, mass, so much gravity that even light can, cannot escape. And somebody in the audience, this is an audience of about 200 people, shouted out, it's a black hole. And according to, to Wheeler, he tried to find the guy afterwards, uh, but never could. And so he, he, when he started using the expression, it became attributed to, to uh, him. Uh, another thing about Wheeler, he was a really kind person and an outstanding teacher. Uh, and uh, and, and, and his first uh, problem that he assigned us in 1961 was how far can a wild goose fly? And obviously he was not looking for a precise answer, but he wanted to know how you would try to solve it. Well, what are the principles that, 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 that even when you're in early in physics understand? Well, the principles of conservation, conservation of energy, uh, momentum, these other, these basic concepts. And so energy was had to be conserved. So how does, a, how does a wild goose stay up in the air and, and, and fly? Well, what he's doing is he's converting energy f stored as fat to potential energy into kinetic energy to, to fight uh, gravity pulling him down. So he, he wanted you, you to think about the, those, those principles. Another thing that Wheeler was, was known for is he was the PhD advisor of Richard Feynman, you know, the, the, the famous US physicist uh, Feynman. But, uh, 
but uh, but these were complicated years in, in 1961, especially for a uh, male uh, in the United States because there was the draft lottery. And uh, in order to, to stay out of the draft in, in order to uh, avoid uh, tromping through the mud uh, thousands of miles away, uh, you, you had to stay in, in school. And so in, at that time, if you were, were gonna be in uh, get, getting a PhD in physics, pretty much the, the, the job market uh, looked like you, even if you got a PhD, you had to, had to be a, in, in nuclear physics. And uh, so in, instead I, I switched to psychology. Uh, and I, when, when I went to, into psychology at Princeton, there was a guy named Sylvan Tompkins, who was a, uh, a wonderful uh, professor. There's also a character named Julian James, whom I met in, in 1964 and became actually very good friends with, uh, especially later when I re re returned to live in Princeton. Uh, and we, be we became uh, very close friends and, and talked about lots of ideas and one of his his uh, critical ideas was consciousness what makes human beings different from other animals and he wrote a book that was published in the 1970s called the origin of consciousness in the breakdown of the bicameral mind and this book actually advanced a, a thesis that consciousness was special to humans and is not possessed by animals because they had two hemispheres. Well, all brains have, have, have two hemispheres, but humans developed the, the art of communicating between the two hemispheres, which are really independent. They're only connected with the ganglia of nerves at the base of the, uh, of the brain at the top of the spine called the corpus callosum. And uh, they, uh, these two hemispheres communicated almost independently through language that they zap messages back and forth. Uh, and so his, his uh, version of consciousness was that people uh, would, would had these two hemispheres talking to, e to each other, almost as if uh, they were, uh, and, and the fact that pre-conscious people would, would uh, hear these messages as messages of gods. Uh, and this was a very, influential on, on, my on my thinking and psychology became very interesting to me is all science, everything we, mat mathematics, even formal logic is obviously filtered through our brain. Uh, so could you go back to the, yes, I, I, I'm not done with that yet. Um, so uh, so I, I, when, when I went to graduate school at, at, uh, at Harvard, I started out in psychology and then I, uh, I realized that I really wasn't that serious about psychology. And I, and I switched to computer science where I got a master's degree. And then I, I actually eventually uh, switched to the Department of Statistics for my, for my eventual PhD, where my advisor was William Cochran, this wonderful uh, Scottish uh, statistician, very, very down to earth guy who taught me experimental design in 1968. And I thought this was a, was a great course because it had formal experimental design, how you learn about the world, how you learn about what works and what doesn't work in terms of interventions. And the other thing about Cochrane's course that was uh, eye-opening for me, it was con completely con consistent with the science that I, I, I learned when I was in physics. And one thing about it is that there was a clear separation between science which is the object of inference and what you do to learn about the science. So what you do to learn about science is you intervene in the real world in some way. So you intervene to measure aspects of science of the, of the world at, at one point in time. So when you intervene, you have to change something. You have to either observe something, which, you know, throw photons at it or something. So the, what you try to learn about is it, is the object at a point in time, at one instant, and you learn about it through what you observe at a, at a subsequent instant. But the, you, the notation that you use to represent the science at the previous point in time is the same. So the, the, the science notation for the science doesn't change as you try to learn about it or measure it. But the, the, but the fact of, of measurement 
changes the signs from the earlier point in time to a later point in time. So that, that way of thinking about it is, uh, is missing data always exists. We cannot go back in time and undo what we did to, to measure the, the science. And this was completely consistent with, with, uh, with two principles in, in, in physics, the well-known Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, for example, which, which says you cannot measure uh, position and momentum at the same point in time. You have to take your choice. They both exist, but you can only measure one with, with, with uh, uh, certainty. And there's another uh, principle that's uh, sometimes confused, which is the observer effect, that the act of observation uh, actually changes the world. It has to do with time, uh, the, the state of science at time two is different from the state of science prior to that. Uh, and but the, whereas the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is, has, has to do with, with, with quantum mechanics and an uncertainty of, of, of being able to uh, uh, measure both things at, at the same point in time. Okay, next slide. So now, uh, so my e exposure to statistics when I en entered Harvard again was through Cochrane, and and he was a, a, a protege of, of Ronald Fisher, uh, and Ronald Fisher had really uh, revolutionized uh, the field of, of statistics. In fact, started in in in, in some real sense, in, in 1925 with, with his book Statistical uh, Methods for Research Workers, and. In the last chapter in, in that 1925 book, he proposed randomization. So if you're trying to learn about what an intervention does, meaning is fertilizer one better than fertilizer two, a controlled fertilizer versus a new fertilizer, or if a, a, a variety of, of, of seeds of a plant is a new variety better than the old variety, you actually should randomize. <clears throat> it turns out that the idea of randomization mathematically was in the air at, at, at the time. So if you read some old uh, uh, student uh, gossip uh, articles in the early 20s, you would say, well, if you had randomized, then the distribution would be this way. So there, this sort of was in the air at Rothamsted, at the Rothamsted Experimental Station, where they were doing ex, uh, studies of different fertilizers and different breeding of, of plants and animals. <clears throat> and, and the idea of actually uh, randomizing was you should, it, and thereby you created balance on all pre-treatment pre variables in expectation. So the fact that it created balance was in these articles in, in, in various expressions. But, but Fisher said that, I know that's what the mathematics says, but I'm saying you should actually do that. You should actually toss coins to assign treatments. And, and, and no one had actually done that as far as I can find before. There's, there's some debate about that, uh, uh, but I will say a, a little about that in, in the subsequent slide. Uh, now there was recondite advice at the time that if you had unbalanced covariates, so an important pre-treatment variable that was unbalanced between let's, a treatment group and a control group. Uh, Fisher actually uh, said he would re-randomize. Now he didn't write that, and I, I, I can't find that advice anywhere. So we got a bad randomization, meaning for example, in, a, in the study of hypertensive drugs where they have males and females, if, if, a, if you did complete randomization, it's possible uh, that all the males would get an active treatment and all the females would get the controlled treatment bad advice, uh, bad randomization. So the advice was from, from the, what, what Fisher wrote is live with the randomization because that's what underlied all the mathematics uh, like the uh, F, F distributions and T distributions. <clears throat> but when I talked to Cochrane about what Fisher actually would do, he would re-randomize. He would throw away the bad randomized allocation and look for a better one. At the, at the time, uh, the, the theory was, was, more, was complicated because you didn't have the usual symmetry arguments working for you. They were actually, you, it led to truncated distributions, uh, which, you, which, the, for the, for which the computation was back then impossible. 
but the theory and application is now being pursued because the computing is much better than it was. It's being pursued in a, in a series of articles I wrote um, with a, a former PhD student, uh, and uh, it's being pursued in, in other work that I'm, that I'm doing with, with other people. Uh, and, and that's it's being pursued because the computation is is, uh, is possible. Uh, now, if you if if you did uh, uh, get an acceptable randomization and you were living with it, how would you do the assessment of the, of was there a causal effect? And, and here he had this very deep idea that's related to uh, Karl Popper's, or the philosopher's idea of uh, science advances by rejecting myths. And so what, what, what Fisher did is he had this, this method of inference where you hypothetically re-randomize. You look at the data, you put down a, a null hypothesis and a hypothesis that that you don't that you want to prove is wrong. And so and this uh, re-randomization was a stochastic proof by contradiction. So it's not really a proof by contradiction, but you get a probability that you would observe data, but you did observe this extreme if the null hypothesis were true. Uh, I, I think it's a it's a brilliant I, idea that that led to a sort of a, a deceptive version of it uh, because the name and Pearson ideas which are which I think are not nearly as sharp uh, and I and I think that this uh, proof by con contradiction it, it can be uh, embedded within a Bayesian framework and I wrote about this in an annals of statistics paper in 1984 where I called it a posterior predictive uh, check or where the p-value in fact is a posterior predictive p-value, where instead of having a sharp null hypothesis, what I mean by sharp is there's no missing data anymore. So you can fill in all, all uh, missing values. Uh, and, uh, and, but instead of having a sharp null hypothesis, you can have a uh, stochastic null hypothesis. So it becomes a, um, a, a Bayesian posterior predictive p-value. Uh, but Fisher, even though he was never formal about the, this idea of an alternative hypothesis, because he said, I have never, I, I have no problem in choosing a test statistic, you just do it. He clearly understood this, uh, a non-null causal effect, because in this 1918 paper, years before 1980, uh, the 1925 book, he has this direct quote, if we say this boy has grown tall, he has, he, because he has been well fed, we are not merely tracing out the cause and effect in the individual instance, in, in this particular case, we're suggesting that he might have quite probably, not very well written, uh, might quite probably have been worse fed. And in that case, he would have been shorter. So he's comparing the boy's height being well fed with his hypothetical height had he been poorly fed. So he clearly has this idea of, of, the, of an alternative hypothesis here, the alternative is being well, uh, poorly fed because the, what's observed is being well fed. But he never had any explicit notation, never any mathematical notation uh, for formalizing non-null cause effects. Despite, I mean, it's very difficult to, to criticize uh, Fisher's uh, uh, work with respect to distributions. Uh, under this sharp null hypothesis, tremendous geometric uh, uh, insights uh, uh, based on symmetry arguments. And Fisher was was legally blind, uh, and and so he, according to Cochran, he would he would when he had a problem, he would you know sit down, close his eyes, and think about things. And we have these blasts of insights, I guess that that came in, 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 into his mind. So where do we get the notation? That, that, that was uh, arose in, in the textbooks in the mid 20th century, like, like in Kempthorne. Uh, next slide. That's okay. I mean, it's, I, I, these things happen with, with, with Zoom, especially when, the, uh, when participants are thousands of miles away. <clears throat> so the notation that was used in, in subsequent years to, to describe uh, and mathematically, uh, the this, this situation with about causal effects was actually due to Neyman, <clears throat> Jersey Neyman, 
in his 1923 uh, master's thesis, where he defined written in, in, in Polish. And this thesis was not translated to English until 1990. Although because Neyman, uh, by, uh, before 1990, was at Berkeley, the notation had a, had a, a, a big influence because Berkeley was uh, the outstanding uh, department of statistics at, uh, at the time Neyman was, 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 was there. <clears throat> uh, and so it, it, he defined the estimates, the quantities to be estimated in randomized experiments as functions of potential outcomes for n units. In other words, y of zero is the array of potential outcomes under treatment zero, and y one is the array of potential outcomes under an active treatment labeled here uh, treatment one. <clears throat> and and uh, Neyman at uh, uh, 23 was written in Polish, as I said, translated to English in 1990. And I, I made up the phrase potential outcomes really to stay close to this 1923 paper, where at least the translation of into English of this, of this paper in 1990 called them uh, potential yields, where the units of the experiment were the n units were plots of land, and the outcomes there were yields of of uh, of, of a particular variety of of a of a plant under different fertilizers, and so the treatment zero would be the controlled fertilizer, and treatment one, for example, would be the uh, active fertilizer. And and Neyman actually used this notation, although later. He denigrated. He 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 said, oh, "I was I was just fooling around. I really didn't know what I was doing." Uh, and there are there are other e e examples of, of of that in science where you can see people using notation that they really didn't understand the the full uh, meaning of. Fact, actually, you can you can see that uh, in in some of the work on in uh, relativity as well. Uh, I don't want to get off the, onto that topic, although I could answer some questions about it. And so Neyman put down this notation and implicitly assuming something that I, I later called sutva, stable unit treatment value assumption. And all this, this means is that if I give, if I have Y, which is the outcome for plot I, so I indexes the plots and W indexes the, the different treatments. So that's a function of i and w. That's all that's that says to mean. It's a well-defined function so that you have that notation. And so all that the outcome for particular uh, treatment on a particular plot, it's just a function of that plot and of that treatment. It's not affected by the fertilizers that the other plots got. So for example, uh, uh, this uh, uh, ex excluded interference between units. For example, if you're doing an agricultural experiment where rain would move one fertilizer on one plot to an adjacent plot. So the adjacent plots not only were affected by the fertilizer they received, but by fertilizers adjacent plots got. Uh, and so uh, agronomists knew this for hundreds of years, but, but uh, this assumption wasn't really formalized until the combination of, of Neyman and this uh, explicit assumption that I made up in, in, the, in uh, uh, called Sutfa in 1968. Um, so the, the point is that you cannot observe both of these on any one unit. You cannot observe both the outcome under, under active treatment and the outcome under controlled treatment. And so th this idea was, was kind of natural to me because I grew up with, with Heisenberg that you that, that just it existed, but the name and contribution went beyond this notation. He evaluated the operating characteristics of procedure procedures such as estimators over the randomization distribution. So he said, "Okay, I observe this under the uh, uh, what would be the expectation of the uh, of a statistic, an estimator such as the observed outcomes, the observed potential outcomes under active treatment." minus the observed potential outcomes under control treatment. That's a statistic thing, a function of observed values. But now we'll see what I would have observed under all possible values. And I can derive uh, 
operating characteristics for, for such as unbiasedness of this difference in observed sample means. Uh, very uh, important idea, which eventually led to all the name and Pearson stuff. Uh, he also worried about the, uh, the role of non-additive unit level causal effects. An additive unit level causal effect is the difference between y i of zero and y i of one is the same for all i. So that would say that uh, the new fertilizer is better than the old fertilizer by the same amount on all plots. <clears throat> and and Neyman worried about that in in, uh, in, in 1923 because he he not only def def defined unbiasedness, uh, but but he he eventually defined uh, what later was called confidence intervals. Now, in, uh, in, in later years, he denied the lack of understanding in 1923, pointing out that the, uh, that the definition of, uh, of, of the potential outcomes was an important I idea. But he said, I really didn't understand the, the real depth of randomization because I never advocated it. It was Fisher who, who advocated uh, randomization, actually randomizing plots, not, not Neyman. Next slide, please. So comments on, on, on these insights. Well, these are 20th century insights, at least as, as, as far as, as, as I can see. I, I, I've looked a little bit, I'm not a, a, a really in-depth historian like Steve Stigler, my former colleague at the University of Chicago, but I think I can't find any, any uh, corresponding insights in, in science where you define uh, an S demand, quantities you want to estimate, in terms of measurable quantities, which but these are individually measurable, but they cannot be simultaneously measured, uh, measurable even theoretically. Uh, these, I, saw, I, I really think these are really 20th century insights that were seem to be floating around uh, uh, Northern Europe at at the time. Uh, was 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 Fisher really the the the, uh, the first to have these? Well, Steve Stigler likes to point to a, an American psychologist, philosopher, um, Peirce, whose, whose father was a mathematician at Harvard in the late, late 19th uh, century, who was writing about unbiasedness from, from uh, uh, taking representative samples. Very, very close, but as far as I can see, there's, there's no uh, use of the idea of randomization as a base of, of inference the way, uh, the way Fisher did. But anyway, after uh, Fisher proposed randomization in his last chapter of statistical methods for research workers, uh, randomized trials quickly dominated agricultural and animal, animal breeding in the uh, United Kingdom and uh, became even dominant in the United States in uh, industrial work. More applied work was, 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 was done, uh, uh, for example, by Oscar Kempthorne, uh, uh, Bill Cochran and Gertrude Cox, George Box, wonder, wonderful work by, by, by Box in industrial experiments. Uh, David Cox uh, uh, wrote a wonderful textbook, 1958, on uh, planning experiments. And supporting more mathematical work, more, almost pure mathematical work, was done at the Indian Statistics Institute, which is founded by Mihaly Novus. Work was done there by R.C. Bose, Nair, C.R. Rao, who is still going strong in his uh, 100th birthday. He had his uh, 100th birthday, uh, I are we 101st, I think, um, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, and subsequently, randomized controlled trials entered Western industry. They started uh, doing uh, industrial experiments and at the end of the Second World War, when uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the West, the Allies had completely sort of destroyed uh, uh, Japan in, at the end of World War II, uh, we, we sent uh, Edward Deming, uh, the West sent Edward Deming to help rebuild uh, uh, Japanese industry and through the use of, of quality control 
in, in experiments and in, in, in randomized experiments. So the combination of randomized experiments and especially with the idea of quality control, uh, Japan has, has given a Deming medal uh, for quality control since 1951. Uh, uh, but the in insights uh, that, that were um, uh, exposed in, the, in this work with randomized trials were really limited uh, at, at this time to non-conscious units, plants, animals, uh, or industrial objects like uh, widgets, you know, various uh, mechanical uh, things that we built or paints that would do experiments on paints for, for painting uh, the dividing uh, lines in, in, in roads, for example. Next slide. The transportation of these insights uh, to randomized uh, controlled trials with conscious units came before the transportation, well before the transportation of these insights uh, to non-randomized studies. Now, in, in medicine, my understanding is the, the first randomized experiments were, were done in the United Kingdom in 1946, the Medical Research Center and a guy named Sir Bradford Hill on the Streptococcus, uh, uh, where they have uh, antibiotics, the study of antibiotics. They actually did a randomized experiment. Another early big randomized experiment was Salk vaccine, where it was like thousands of, of, of people that was done in 1954. It was actually a randomized experiment with conscious units and they actually used blinding them. The idea that you don't tell the patient, which you, or, this, or the kid in this case, which vaccine you're getting, the, uh, the, the active vaccine or placebo vaccine. Uh, of, and uh, in, 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 the, in the 50s, in the mid late 50s, uh, the United States Food and Drug Administration, it became almost wedded to the use of, of randomized experiments. And so randomized experiments entered pharmacology. And before this, before the 1950s, and Paul Meyer was my colleague at the University of Chicago, was the main instigator of this. He really sort of fell in love with, with randomized experiments. <clears throat> And of what, what, when I say falling in love, I think there is an overzealous in, adherence to the intention to treat principle to estimate the effect of, of the assignment to treatment rather than the effect of assignment and receipt of treatment, which I don't think was very wise. So the idea of intention to treat is you analyze the data, the way the units got assigned, not what they took. And I think this is a, a very uh, relevant comment now because I view uh, the, the recent Nobel Prize in economics, which is given to uh, my uh, co-authors, Angus and, and Imbens and uh, David Card for actually uh, implementing a study in the non-randomized, uh, interesting uh, inference in, in a non-randomized study. Uh, uh, this, the idea of non-compliance, because that conscious units have, have this habit of not agreeing with what they were randomized to, not agreeing to, to doing what they were randomized to do. <clears throat> uh, and, and the interesting thing is, but there's no use of these fisher and insights or the notation in non-randomized trials. In fact, it, it wasn't used at, at all, I think, until I proposed uh, using it in, in, in a 1974 paper. So for example, if you look at the 1964 US Surgeon General's report, report on cigarette smoking and lung cancer, very important study. Uh, everything was done by regression. In fact, ordinary least squares regression. Uh, so, so it was nothing, uh, no, no use of the insights from, from randomized experiments in this giant observational studies. And in fact, <clears throat> regression was used everywhere, epidemiology, economics, social science, psychology, sociology, they all used regression with the potential outcomes replaced by the observed outcome with an indicator WI for each unit for which treatment they got. So they would do a regression of the observed value, this YI OBS, that's the observed value for each, each unit uh, on an indicator variable WI and covariance. But this notation violates this, this principle that I learned when I was a kid 
that you separate the science from what we do to learn about the science. So this y obs notation became completely prevalent <clears throat> for dealing with, with non-randomized data, starting actually in the, at the end of the uh, 19th century uh, with doing regression. There's an old uh, paper by uh, uh, Yule uh, uh, on, on, on how you do this uh, using this observed value notation and regression. Next slide, please. So it, it turns out this sequence of papers came to be called uh, the Rubin Causal Model. So it's a name Paul Holland made up in his 1986 journal of the Royal, of the uh, JASA, uh, American Statistical Association paper. Rubin Causal Model, which I sort of the, proposed this model in, in a paper and I wrote in 1974. There's a follow-up paper in Proceedings in 75, paper on missing data where I, 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 I called missing data in a randomized experiment should be treated as missing data, uh, even, even from a Bayesian point of view, from a frequentist point of view, talked about how randomization inference is basically based on missing data, followed up with another publication, 1977. Uh, and probably the, the, the uh, in some sense, the most complete paper was in 1978 in, in the Annals of Statistics that was on, on Bayesian inference for causal effects. And the, the contributions of this paper, I think some of it were, were, were beyond what, what Neyman did, but certainly built on, on, on Neyman's uh, uh, notation. This uh, notation of potential outcomes define causal effects in all situations, not just in randomized experiments. In other words, the idea that you can separate the science from what you do to learn about the science says you first define what you're trying to estimate. And in an observational study, you're trying to estimate the same thing you're, you're trying to estimate in a randomized experiment. You're just intervening in different ways. Actually, Neyman, when I, when I had an office next to his at Berkeley, disagreed. He said, no, you, you can't talk about uh, causal effects without randomization. You, you have to have randomization, even talk about causal effects. Otherwise, it's too speculative. So instead, Name and said, let's talk about the stars. Uh, another contribution of, of his paper was that you needed an assignment mechanism for causal inference. So an assignment mechanism is just a generalization of, a, of randomization. So it's the probability distribution for the treatment indicator given the covariates and the uh, potential outcomes. So it's a, that's probability of W given covariates X and potential outcomes Y0, Y1, with a general dependence on Y0 and Y1. And I defined unconfounded uh, in, I guess, 74, I think, uh, to be when this assignment mechanism doesn't depend upon the potential outcomes. And you know it doesn't depend upon the potential outcomes in randomized controlled trials, because you did the randomization. And, and it was, you, you couldn't see the potential outcomes and you didn't use them. Or, and you didn't use any unobserved uh, predictors of potential outcomes. For Bayesian inference, I defined this concept called ignorable, where the uh, assignment mechanism just depend upon observed values, for example, in sequential randomized control tiles. So that, uh, and, and this de uh, potential dependence on Y obs the observed value as in you're doing a play the winner uh, 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 randomization. So you randomize the first unit, but after the, after the first unit, you change the odds in getting active treatment versus control treatment. So it, the odds are in favor of the more successful treatment based on the earlier units. So here Y odds refers to all the observed values of Y0 and, and Y1. And of course, in, in, in Bayesian inference, uh, you have to model the science in addition to the assignment mechanism. Now, and I call it uh, uh, ignorable because that factor in the likelihood or the posterior distribution can be ignored and you get the same inference, in, in, to get the same answer. Uh, so, the, uh, so the assignment mechanism creates missing and absurd potential outcomes. And I say an artistic uh, touch is, is, is needed here because all models are wrong. You know, that's an expression that goes back to George Box, 
or before that, uh, von Neumann even, even said that the real world is much too complex for anything but simplified models. So if, you know, if, von no if the math <clears throat> was too hard for von Neumann, then it was obviously too hard for mortals. Uh, so that the idea, the idea of, of, of models that we use in science are always wrong. They're always too, too, too simple. I say an artistic touch is, is uh, needed here. And there's a great P Picasso quote. I don't know if I have it here, but it's, uh, uh, he's talking about computers. And Picasso said, computers are worthless. They only give answers. And, and Picasso's point, I think, is, is a great expression of the field of statistics. Thing that, that makes statistics artistic is you have to posit models. And, uh, and you know these models are, are, are wrong, but they're, they're, they're working hypotheses uh, that, that have to be discarded as, as you go along. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the fundamental problem facing causal inference, which is an expression that I made up in the 1975 paper, uh, it's a missing data problem. Uh, and you know, Paul Holland, had a, had a more eloquent way of saying this in his uh, uh, Jazza paper in 1986, but it's an expression that, 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 I, that, I, well, that was in this 75 uh, paper. So for each unit, and here we have an ex example of n units and either a control treatment zero or an active treatment one, you get to observe either y1 or y0, you can't observe both. And, and the, and the random assignment of active versus control means a representative sample of yi1 will be compared to a representative sample of yi0. Obvious? Well, once you put down the notation, it's obvious. Notation with the question marks and the checks, it's obvious. But you have to have Neyman's notation to do that. And you have to have the idea this notation applies beyond randomized experiments. And, and then you have to have the idea is you need a model on this assignment mechanism that creates missing and observed data in order to draw inferences about the missing potential outcomes. So I, I think that that was uh, an important insight. And, and in fact, uh, I think it's the basic uh, fundamental idea uh, behind this year's Nobel Prize in e e economics, uh, because David Card was actually doing uh, Causal inference in a uh, uh, study where an observational study where he had hypothetical randomization. He didn't describe it that way. Hypothetical randomization of fast food restaurants in New Jersey versus Pennsylvania, uh, and he the hypothetical experiment again not said this way, but uh, it had to be on his mind. Was a coin was tossed to see whether the whether the restaurant was situated in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, because New Jersey and Pennsylvania had different laws, different state laws on the minimum wage. And so the units in that experiment were the different fast food restaurants and the hypothetical randomization was were they in Pennsylvania or uh, New Jersey where there were different minimum wage laws. This obviously has important imp economic implications and uh, which eventually led to uh, David Card's Nobel Prize and uh, Ingus and, and Imben's uh, use of these potential outcomes uh, to, to describe the methods. They're both, they're both very generous. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sort of jealous of, of it, but, but it, it, was not a, it was not any more a mistake for the Nobel Prize to do that than a mistake than lots of the Nobel Prize uh, had, had mistakes in, the, that, in that same sense. Okay, next slide. So it's a mistake to, to do this re regression. The use of this re re regression goes back to the 19th century for causal inference, but it's a mistake to, to regress its observed value on an indicator for which treatment you got and on co co covariates. Why is it a mistake? Well, look at this notation. It, it loses the potential outcomes and, and the key Fisher name and concepts when using the observed value notation. It mixes up this y obs mixes up the assignment mechanism in, in, the, in science. And here, uh, my the insights, which built on Neyman's insight from the notation, uh, is you, you want to separate 
the science here, the, the, the whys from what you did to learn about the science, the Ws. I mean, this was what's critical to the, the uh, 20th century uh, uh, in, insights. And here this mixes it all up again, suppresses these key insights. There are no missing data. So once you write this down and you're regressing the observed value of Y on the observed Ws and the, uh, and the observed covariates, what's the estimate? Hmm, must be parameters. Well, parameters are always missing because they're, they're hypothetical. So, but, but this, this uh, notation for observational, its use in observational became standard in biostatistics, economics, epidemiology, everywhere. And even great statisticians and epidemiologists, for example, Fisher, I, and I can't talk about these papers, I don't have time, but I can find uh, mistakes that, that Fisher made uh, in, in dealing with uh, 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 secondary outcomes in, uh, in randomized experiments. Uh, he made mistakes. Cochrane made mistakes. Cornfield made mistakes. They, they confused themselves in observational studies, because they're all using this observed value notation and talking about doing regressions. The cornfield uh, quotation that's on the next slide, I think is particularly revealing. So next slide, please. It's a bad influence on the way observational studies were quote handled because there was no design phase and they instead confused analyses and they, they, and they mixed up association versus uh, causation, came muddled. I think one of the real examples of that is a, what's called now a case control study. And cases refer to people with a disease, controls refer to people without the disease. And I much prefer the, the, the terminology case non-case because the control in a case control study is completely different than a control in a randomized experiment. Control in a randomized experiment is a person who's exposed to the control treatment in, an, uh, in this uh, case con uh, control study, a case, a control is somebody without the disease. So it's very confusing uh, terminology because with case control studies use the sampling mechanism is how you drew samples, but they're confounded. The sampling mechanisms in a case control study are confounded because they by definition depend upon the observed potential outcomes. In other words, uh, what they did is they typically they looked at all the cases, all the people with the disease, and they compared them to uh, non-cases, people without the disease. So this is what you had to do when you're looking at, at, at a rare outcome. You almost had to do it because they're, they, uh, otherwise it became too expensive to collect data. Uh, but here's a, uh, a quote from Cornfield, who is the, uh, the, the main epidemiologist on, on the smoking and lung cancer. Uh, it's a, a direct quote from a paper that he wrote in 1959. We now consider the distinction between the kinds of inferences that can be supported by observational studies, these non-randomized studies, whether prospective or retrospective. So retrospective means these case control, prospective means you, you uh, go forward by, by uh, uh, looking at, at uh, uh, smokers and non-smokers. Whereas the, uh, a case control looks at lung cancer versus non-lung cancer. So, uh, and so the prospective studies or retrospective and those, but they're observational and those that can be supported by experimental studies. That there is, is a distinction seems undeniable, but its exact nature is elusive. And I, I agree with it at that, at that time it was, was elusive because it didn't become formalized until I did it in the 1977 by putting down an assignment mechanism which embedded these two kinds of studies within one framework and could define what the benefit of randomization was. It's, it's unconfoundedness. It's that the assignment mechanism cannot depend upon potential outcomes because you did the assignment. But in, a, uh, in an observational study, whether prospective or retrospective, this unconfoundedness of the assignment mechanism is an assumption. And there's a big difference between uh, uh, how well justified the assumption in a randomized experiment is versus the assumption in an observational study. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the starting conclusions, I mean, the starting conclusions on, on causality, and uh, that's why I, I hope this, this was a, uh, a useful uh, introductory lecture. First of all, you should retain the key insights from the past. Key insights meaning insights from uh, Naaman and Fisher. But as you get rid of confusion from the past, get rid of the fact that everybody's doing everything by regression and they're replacing the potential outcomes by the observed outcome and trying to do e squares regression. Another important conclusion is to realize that the ideas behind randomized controlled trials are extremely recent. People have been talking about causality for thousands of years. You know, which direction should I hunt for food? Should I plant this variety or plant that variety when we became a, or an agrarian society? Uh, but the ideas are extremely recent. These are 20th century ideas. Now we should certainly update statistical methods for, in both design and analysis to take advantage of modern computing. So what I mean by uh, design and, and modern, you know, take advantage of modern computing, is take the advantage of modern computing to throw away bad randomized allocations, use uh, machine learning ideas to, to uh, draw thousands of randomized, randomized allocations and then compare balance on, on, on zillions of covariates and understand the geometry behind that and then throw away the bad allocations and you should encourage mathematical precision, especially in notation and logical flow. So I don't care about mathematical precision in these, in these stupid uh, uh, theorems about asymptotic balance and stuff like that. Take advantage of modern computing and stay with, with finite sample methods as, as, as much as, as, as possible. And this precision in, in thinking and in logical flow can have critical consequences in, in, in in current in challenging applications. For example, now in, in placebo effects, I think one of the uh, really in, important areas of, of uh, uh, advancement can be uh, can built on some of these I, I ideas of uh, placebo effects using this notation of, of, of potential outcomes and for which I, th I think the, this, this Nobel Prize was, was recently given. Okay, so I, I think I probably have run out of time, if not more, uh, it's four minutes after 10 as I get. So uh, I, will, I will let our host say how we should proceed. I thought we have the next slide. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. The last slide is yes. the newer general ideas. Okay. So this, and, and here is really this idea of propensity score for, for, for designing studies, both experimental and, and observational studies. This idea that uh, you, 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 uh, summarize uh, all zillions of covariates by a low dimensional summary. So this is, is really is, is, is tied to uh, machine learning ideas and use these both for designing experimental and observational studies. Uh, so this propensity score idea is due to this, this paper by uh, Paul Rosenbaum and I wrote in 1983 that you can design observational studies and propensity scores because they, they are not a function of potential outcomes, they can be used in design. Much more important idea than, uh, than the, its, its use as an analysis tool. And re-randomization experiments to avoid unlucky allocations. And this is a, an expanded uh, uh, template uh, for observational studies. Uh, and it's another joint paper with a, with a sequence of, 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 of uh, papers. Uh, another really important idea is what I, what Paul Rosen, not Paul, uh, Constantine Frangakis and I call principal stratification, which uh, generalizes this idea of instrumental variables from economics. So I, I, I think this is with principal stratification, I think as, as a basic idea, that's it sort of got the Nobel Prize. And I mean, I'll, I'll make the tie there, even though formally it didn't. Uh, principle stratification with, with complications that deal with, with not only non-compliance, which is the instrumental variables uh, setting, but uh, uh, basically uh, uh, this Rubin and, 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 Tom, and, and uh, Thomas paper and placebo effects. This is the, this paper I, I, I recently wrote where the, uh, that, that generalization is, 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 is made uh, using uh, 
actually in this is a paper says that when you're doing um, randomized experiments that's currently done for a, a new drug, for example, the way it's, it's done, the placebo controlled trials, and the fact that placebo effects, meaning that people think they're getting the active treatment and that affects the outcome. And if you do a placebo controlled randomized trial and now you approve a drug, when people uh, have a, are taking an approved drug, they know they're getting an active treatment. When you fill a prescription farm, you know you're not getting a placebo. We're treated in practice are getting the placebo effect in addition. And what that leads to in practice is uh, higher doses of drug that you, than what you need for the outcome effect. Because the effect on the outcome, you're already getting the placebo effect when you go to a drugstore and, 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 you, and you fill a prescription. So in practice, I think 80 or something like 50 to 60% of drugs as approved by FDA from placebo controlled trials are ratcheted down in the future based on observational data, saying the doses were too high, led to too many side effects. But the dose in, 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 that's approved for practice is the dose that was used in the placebo controlled trials. But when giving that dose, the, the units, the, the patients, what you observe is that in addition to the drug effect, you're getting from placebo effect. So the, the, the drug that's being as assigned is too high because it, it's, it's, it's being assigned to get the effect the real effect of the drug plus the placebo effect. So this 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 twenty twenty paper that I wrote that that's uh, uh, published in Andrew's journal, I believe. Uh, no, no, it's maybe it's the uh, uh, no the Japanese journal, uh, Cosmo yeah. Shimashu's Shur journal. Uh, actually, is about that 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 the top. I'm going to have other things to, to submit to uh, Andrew's journal on on this topic. I think it's a very important topic. Okay, I think I'm finally done. Yes. And thank you for your patience as we struggle with the slides. Thank you so much. And sorry for the slides. It's been too excited to see you today. <laughs> <laughs> Very kind. Thank you. Okay, so the next part of the, uh, of the seminar will be the photo session. Um, please, all the guests, open your camera and then we're going to take a group photo. 下面我们将拍一个集体照，然后请各位同学和老师打开你们电脑前的摄像头，然后露出你们灿烂的微笑。我们大家来和Rubin合一个影。We have like 17 pages of people <laughs> who are here today listening to your talk. That's nice. Yeah, we, we have like 500 people uh, today. Uh, That's a lot of people. It is, it is. We have uh, crowds of guests here. Thank you so much, Ruby, uh, for, for the wonderful talk. And also, uh, Sorry for the slides being stumbling. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but but it's very, very nice to have you here. And now let's move on to the discussion session. Uh, please turn off all of your cameras. I saw a lot of friendly and familiar faces here. <laughs> uh, 请各位把那个摄像头关上。我们稍后会把合影发到那个, uh, 好嘞,谢谢谢谢,请各位关上你们的摄像头,然后这样我们可以继续接下来的环节。
不是又看不到了？哎，啊、uh, ，And now is the discussion session. I'm sorry if my computer is not working really well today. And、uh, let us welcome the three、uh, speakers. Let us welcome our three、uh, important guests for today's session.、Uh, there will be Professor Zhou Xiaohua. I saw your camera is on.、Uh, Andrew Zhou and、uh, Professor Zhao Xiliang. Zhao 老师现在在线吗？嗯，在的，在的哈。啊、uh, ，I'm Professor Cui Peng。在的。Okay、uh,。嗯。啊 ，and then to comment and Rubin's talk, and then we are gonna have a, a open discussion session. So you may, um, you may each one ask questions, uh, to Professor Donald Rubin. And now, now I'll pass the mic to Professor, uh, Zhou Xiaohua, from Peking University.、Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Hi, Dong.、Uh, it's hey, very Andrew, nice you? to hear you talk you. again. <laughs> yes. And、uh, ever even I heard this talk before, but every time I will gain insight from your talk. Yeah, yeah. I that I think one of the reasons is that I、uh, I use a limited number of of slides, and so the talk is always slightly different. Yeah. Anyway, it's a very great talk. I will just comment few things and、uh, also. Maybe uh, uh, just uh, discuss a little bit the further work actually based on principal strata、uh, ideas. I think it's a very important idea. And by the way, so I have known Don for like over twenty five years, old friend of、yeah. mine. <laughs> And uh, actually, my uh, research in in causal inference actually introduced by Don to me <laughs> about.、Uh, I think I can remember is when I was doing post at Harvard or <laughs> when I started. But but one work I had done with Don is about encouragement design. I don't know if you remember. Well,、uh, Andrew, your your voice is breaking up. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you now. Okay,、uh, but yeah, it, I just the, yeah, I just said look. Said, the, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So what I say is that uh, my uh, research in causal inference actually introduced、uh, you to me about 25 years ago. Yes.、Uh, about a study about the randomized encouragement design for flu shot. Actually, that's a paper、right. we did with Emmons and、uh, and his students. That's right. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> yes. And, and, and then actually, that's a great work, and then got the、uh, award from、uh, I think International Bayesian Society. Yes, that's right. Mutual award. Yeah, actually, so I'm very grateful. Actually, you are introducing me to the field of the causal inference, and then,、uh, and then we have done some work. So I want to mention a little bit the 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 Rubin framework、uh, for causal. You call the Rubin causal、uh, model. I think I like that model because I think one thing、uh, Dan probably、uh, didn't mention, maybe too polite in his talk, is I think is a, a Rubin causal model actually. Clearly distinguish between estimation and estimation. I think that's actually very crucial. I feel in biostatistics in the medical field. So what that means is the estimation is quantity is determined by science. So scientific question you want to ask. So that is given by estimation, which has nothing to do with the model with assumptions.、Yes. I think that should be very clear because uh, because uh, particularly the causal inference became more popular. In computer science, in artificial intelligence, and in other fields, but I feel like when I read those papers, it's not clear to me what they are estimating, what they are trying to do. <laughs> they are just through all the jargon which we talk about the mathematics stuff, and then the 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 notation really get confused because our audience mostly actually from the computer science. I think the field.、Uh, so I think it's very glad that actually that、uh, Don you give a talk in this audience. <laughs>、uh, yeah, okay, it's good. Yeah, because I think this audience most familiar with the pearls, <laughs> the graphing model. I think、yeah. my understanding is, but I think it's good. I mean, the the pearls graphing model I think has the their own usage, has, has own usage. But on the other hand, I think is we may we may need to need to clear what are the scientific questions and what are the estimate. Where estimate is the parameter which defines scientific questions. I think if you don't make that clear, everything will 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 I think will go wrong afterwards. 
Then after you have an estimate, so clearly defined and everybody understand, then you talk about estimations. So where does the assumption come in? Because the, the estimation, whether you can estimate, estimate depends on the data you have. You have a, if you have a randomized trial data or you have a long compliance or you have truncation by death. So, so you have to very clear, carefully uh, study the data you have uh, to estimate, estimate. And then also clearly to make your assumptions, which to make estimate estimable. So that's a crucial, I think that part of the causal inference to say the parameter you have is whether it's estimable. In other words, is the parameter you have can be estimated consistently based on the data you have. I think that part I think is part of the, uh, I, I think the key, I mean, we maybe don't agree uh, in the causal inference compared with other fields the, as the identifiability issues. Uh, and then the, the third, I think is important is to check your assumptions you made in your causal inference. Because some assumption makes sense, some assumption doesn't. So if the assumption doesn't make no sense in, the, in, pra in practice, then I don't think your causal inference make any sense. Uh, so that's I learned from Don actually to work on those uh, medical fields, <laughs> the problem. Yeah. So I want to also mention a little bit about the, the some uh, extension, uh, as actually some application of the principles of certification Don mentioned just a little bit. So actually that's, uh, uh, he mentioned about the student, uh, uh, Constantine uh, from Caucus, actually. So that's one of the students actually worked with us. We worked with me and Don on the, also around my encouragement design. So we have uh, actually two paper on that area. So I want to mention, based on the principles of application, there ha uh, I have done some work actually, also motivated by the Don's, uh, the principle. So why is truncation by death? Uh, how do you make causal inference when you have a truncation by death? Uh, so what that problem is, is this. Uh, if you're interested in some parameters like quality of life in five years after you take the treatment, but the people might die one year after receive the treatment. So, so for the people who die, what are their outcomes? So actually that's a very interesting issue, right? Yeah. Now, yes. Is, is, can you still treat it as missing data? Which some people did to say, even they die, they say they're still missing the quality of life five years after they die. So that's actually might be a problem because I don't know what the quality of life for dead people. <laughs> so, so that's actually the big issue. Uh, so that's actually uh, uh, show the, the, the principle of the stratification really work in these settings. So, so we have done some work uh, to how do you make causal inference when, when, when you have a truncation by death. So that's actually is very important because that one uh, is commonly occur in medical research. Because for most of the uh, cohort study, large cohort study, you all have some people who die during the study. So how do you deal with that? I think, and then they don't maybe have a time to talk about the truncation by that, but that's actually is a very important applications in medical research. Uh, uh, so that another area I think I also get a lot of attention recently is the precision medicine. Uh, to say, how do you do the causal inference in precision medicine? So you might say, what is a precision medicine? Probably in this audience may not familiar. So precision medicine is like this. As we know in the, in the medicine, there's no one drug can treat all patients well. So, so, you all, so the, the precision medicine sometimes also called personalized medicine. So that means you may want to tailor your treatment uh, based on characteristics of the patients. So maybe let's say for the cancer uh, patients, you may have the chemotherapy, or you may have surgery, but for some people, it's better to use chemo than, than other people based on the genetic information of the subject. So that area actually is called a heterogeneous treatment effect. So that means, uh, so the, the, in the literature, the, uh, in the talk Don mentioned, mostly focused on, I think the overall average treatment effect to the whole population. But sometimes you know, I might, might be interested actually is the subpopulation, uh, so we call it, maybe you want to condition on covariates and then look at the causal effect in the subgroup. So, so they, they call the heterogeneous the treatment effect. But the principle Don just mentioned about the uh, Ruben causal model can still apply, but you have to do more work uh, to make work. Uh, so that's called the heterogeneous treatment effect. Actually, I think this is still the right open area in medicine. Yeah. How, how do you do better? And then uh, particularly when you have uh, observational data, which you have, so one of the difficulty with observational data in causal inference is unmeasured confounders. 
So the reason I think the the card and then even got lower prices, they actually uh, uh, try to use a, 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 a in, instrument variable to crack for the unmajored confounders, which is they call the late. And and later on, I think later on, I think we call the compiler average cause of that, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, but the, so maybe the late is first proposed by Embens and the Angry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then later on, I think we actually in our in a medical field, we 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 prefer the CACE, the compiler average cause of effect. Uh, so so anyway, I think the uh, the the causal inference is getting more and more popular, and I think the current research in causal inference is how do you apply the clear principle like Rubin model to more complicated problem like heterogeneous treatment fact, like big data, so like observational data, like truncation by death, or like right now is artificial intelligence. Like, uh, like, like, like in, in this section audience, most, like say, how do you apply causal inference to, uh, to the reinforcement learning, to recommend, recommend, recommending systems, recommendation systems? which is can't be applied because actually they're doing that. Dan, I don't know, I worry about that. They, in computer science, they apply causal inference to almost all field of the computer science. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But I mean, when we, when we look closely is, I think the framework is not, still not very clear. Actually, one of the paper I'm working on with my student is how do you clearly define the causal framework for recommend, recommending this uh, system? Like say, how do you recommend movie to the people? Which is they doing that all the time because they, they try to introduce causal inference in, in, in that uh, in that framework to make more stable or more uh, 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 they call the robust predictions. Uh, so so uh, uh, the third field I think is in the causal inference is a is a causal prediction. So that's a little yeah. bit different from the causal effect. But I think it's very popular those days in the science to say how can you make prediction which has some causal property, I think. And that one I think needs a lot of work uh, uh, to be done, I think that field, yeah. So, so- uh, Professor so maybe, Joe, Professor Joe, we have limited time. So I want, more maybe want to uh, down comment a little bit is, what do you think about the causal predictions? Do you have any thought on that? No, well, I, I should, you, I, I can say one or two minutes now. If, uh, if, I think there's pr probably, easier for the audience and for, for me as well, instead of trying to remember everybody. If I, if, so if I make a comment. So I, I uh, very much appreciate a Andrew's comments. And, and as, as he said, we've known each other for decades uh, <clears throat> and, and have written papers together. And I think that, that your point about uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the being precision medicine and and the problem of, of of censoring by 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 death. I think the it was the censoring by death. I think has been underappreciated for for years. And I think the idea of thinking about censoring uh, uh, censoring due, due due to death as creating a, a particular principal strata uh, where they the always survivors, the, the subgroup of people who would survive. That's how you try to do it. Do a study, uh, and you want to try to separate the outcome of death. From the outcome of quality of life, I think with many serious diseases, that's a, that, that's an, an important question because otherwise you, you sort of get the wrong answer. <clears throat> um, because the I mean, so how, if you want to look at uh, the effect of an intervention on quality of life, what do you do with people who died? Well, if you just throw them out, then you can get completely the wrong answer. If especially if the uh, uh, if, if one treatment kills people who are weak and then the, the other treatment looks better because it, it lets them survive. So it's, it's, it's just, you've, you've got to uh, worry about, about both outcomes, the death outcome and the, and the quality of life outcome. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done there. So I really, I, I, I second uh, Andrew's comment about uh, that, that this perspective has, has a lot of, of, of things to offer uh, current studies in in, in medicine where with where those are uh, critical uh, attributes. Also, the comment about um, precision medicine, 
certainly I'm, uh, I'm, I'm aware that the, the idea of precision medicine is especially important when, when treating patients. You don't want to, want to, want to treat everybody the same. <clears throat> but one of the I, ideas of uh, precision medicine is you want to obviously have a different treatment for different people. And, the, and there the complication is principal strata are only partially identified. So if you, uh, if, 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 but there, but here's where, where, where the role of covariates can be really important. Uh, and, and I think there's a, 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 probably the most, maybe the, maybe the most relevant paper is, is one that on, on this topic is one that I wrote with uh, Fabrizio Mielli and some of her students, um, uh, her Italian students is <clears throat> here the, the uh, where is this published? I don't. I don't remember right, right, right now. But the but the I, I, idea is that uh, you can the, the covariates help to predict which principal strata you, you, you're in. And obviously, the, uh, the in in medicine, the, the the principal strata help define which treatments uh, work for which sub subgroup group of patients. So I think that's a, a terribly Im, Im, important idea. Uh, and maybe I'll stop there to make sure we have time because I can always come back at the end if, 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 sure. if, if there are things to say. Actually, Professor Tsui Pong is also very interested in this question. Uh, Professor Tsui, do you want to make a comment? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Dom. Uh, hi. This is Peng Tsui here. I'm in the computer science department in Tsinghua University. Actually, we are in the same university now, right? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, there is some problem with my camera. So uh, next time, I, I hope that we can we, we can meet face to face. Um, uh, my question is that actually uh, in the recent years, you know that there is a very obvious trend that in the machine learning community, uh, many researchers, especially very uh, uh, I mean uh, uh, famous researchers in this field, start to talk about causality. Right? We we, we need to embrace causality into the in the machine learning. Uh, actually, from the 2016, we just start to uh, to to think about so what's the limitation and what's the problems that today's machine learning framework cannot solve in the end. Actually, we find that. Uh, there are several problems like uh, explainability and also the stability problem. I mean, the generalization to out of distribution and also fairness issues. Actually, uh, we think that when we trace back, uh, all of these problems are the root cause of these problems is, is just uh, that in the learning framework, we, we, we didn't even try to differentiate the causality and also the correlation. So, because yes. in the in the big data we just uh, absorb a lot of spurious correlations in our model, so that directly lead to these problems. Uh, so uh, uh, I I just want to uh, listen to your uh, thoughts and comments on on this trend. And also uh, the, the second question is when we try to do this, when we try to embrace the causality into the learning. Uh, some researchers just uh, use, uh, for example, the structure causal model. And uh, we, our group actually borrow a lot of ideas from the Rubin's causal model, the potential outcome framework. So um, uh, actually we are not that confident because we are just a halfway. <laughs> uh, we stand in the, uh, uh, in the machine learning community, we just a halfway. Uh, with respect to the causal inference community. So uh, we, we just want to listen to your advice from your perspective. So how can the potential uh, Rubin's ca uh, causal uh, model help in the machine learning tasks? Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll say just, just, a, just a, a couple of sentences now about mm -hmm. this. I think one of the critical things, and I've, over the years I've, I've done a, a a variety of consulting. And uh, very often the main effort is at the front, meaning at, at, at the beginning, when trying to understand exactly what the, what the question is being asked and try to get uh, investigators away from talking about very sort of theoretical things and, mm -hmm. that, and, and, and uh, get them to uh, address what they can do. So 
Well, if, you, if you're talking about uh, causal inference in uh, machine learning, uh, computer science, uh, real world, what, what are the uh, collections of interventions that you can implement? I don't want to talk about the theory mm -hmm. because the, the, the theory will, 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 will follow from the question that you're trying to address. Mm -hmm. if, if, if your eventual answer can't help doing what you want to do, it's worthless. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's one of the, uh, the important I ideas from this uh, uh, 20th century ideas of experimentation is you should try to experiment on things that you can actually do. So in the, in the uh, uh, computer science world, what can you actually do? What are the inter in interventions that you can implement? Now, it, it, and it's, when thinking about that, it implement in the context of a randomized experiment. So what are the, what are the interventions that, it's, that you can actually uh, create and, and do? And mm -hmm. uh, then what are the outcomes that, that you want to achieve? Mm -hmm. So uh, now I think the, uh, the internet kind of experimentation is more, far more complicated than the classical ones for, for one primary reason. Everybody's interfering with everybody else. Mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, it's, it's very hard to get discrete non-interfering uh, units uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, even, in, even if you can do the randomization. Uh, and and there's, there's only one real study that I've been actively involved in, which is something that I, I didn't re refer to here at all, but it has to do with um, uh, in a, you know, actually, uh, it's, it, I, I guess it's, you know, it, it's partially confidential, so I, I probably shouldn't say too much about it, but it, has, mm -hmm. it, it, it worries about these second order causal effects that you get on the internet where, where the units of, of the quote experimentation are not very independent. <clears throat> and so I guess my general it, it, it advice uh, to mm -hmm. people who are thinking about it in terms of internet experiments is to decide, first of all, what the interventions that are possible to do, mm -hmm. and then how to deal with the interference. And I think that's a wide open uh, uh, area in, in how, you, how you deal with uh, interfering uh, units. You know, units who are communicating because the, the network on, on the internet is, is so incredibly vast and, and, you, and you don't, uh, and depending upon how, uh, what the links are between the different nodes in, in, in the uh, network, you, you, get a, uh, you have to get a different type of, of, of uh, uh, inference and a lot of work has to be done there. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether that, that answers your, your question at all, but those are my fast thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, if the time lim uh, time allows, we may ha have more yeah, discussions. Just uh, sure. the host, yeah. Um, you just mentioned about the treatment and how it is important in the causal inference. We actually have Professor Zhao Xiliang who has written uh written the most one of the most popular. Uh, textbooks in econometrics and talking about the policy treatment and policy impact evaluation. So let us welcome Zhang Xinliang to give some comments. Well, actually, can, 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 can you, you me? send me a uh, the title for, for this book, if especially if it's in English? <laughs> okay, no, no, no. I'm going to send you right now. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, we like we, we like. I also like to see you too. <laughs> uh, Professor Ruben, uh, thank you very much for the uh, great lecture uh, uh, about the history of the Ruben Cole model. Uh, Ruben Cole model is actually the basis for cold inference in empirical economics. Uh, economics usually use. Uh, random control trial and a natural, uh, natural experiment trying to identify color effects in economics, uh, especially in liberal economics, uh, yes. which so-called the 
credible revolution in empirical economics by Angrist. Uh, uh, especially uh, Ruben Colomodo is is especially suited to do policy evaluation in, in economics. Uh, after implanting a government policy, governments usually want to know the effects of the policy. So yeah. Ruben Paul model played a great role in those kinds of research questions. Uh, Ruben Paul model can help frame the research question and make the evaluation. However, uh, there is another kind of problem in economics. That is, we uh, we saw the we saw a economic uh, phenomena, and uh, we want to find out the causes of the phenomena or the problem. For example, uh, in two thousand eight, you know, uh, it happened a world economic crisis. So economists want to know what the reason caused this. Uh, uh, crisis. So in this case, I have a question uh, for Robin is that how Robin call model uh, play a role in solve those kind of problems? This is just like another uh, direction uh, from uh, 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 from uh, uh, policy evaluation is from uh, 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 manipulation to find out the, the cause effects. And this problem is try to reverse. Uh, we, we see uh, effects, how to find out the uh, reasons. Can you uh, give uh, 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 some uh, thoughts on this problem? Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think what you're pointing out is a, a uh, really, uh, critical point that uh, actually arises especially in philosophy. So the, uh, if you look sort of historically uh, at, at some of the literature on causal inference, a lot of it is devoted to finding the cause of an effect. So you got sick, what caused that? And, 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 there, and there's this an important distinction between searching for the cause of an effect, which is, I, th I think, really a descriptive que uh, question versus the effects of causes. In other words, when, when you think about randomized e e experiments, what you're randomizing are the causes and then what you can observe are what the effects of, of those causes, those uh, interventions yes. are. But as, as we look at data, we, what we see are uh, a, a state, you know, the, the, the current state of, of, of affairs. And, and here we, we, we're constantly drawn to, to wondering, ah, what caused that effect? And in yes. fact, in, in my mind, one of the revolutions of the of the 20th century, this experimental revolution and the cause effect revolution, is that's almost an unanswerable question. What the cause of an effect is? Uh, let me give you a trivial example that they've used for for years. So somebody uh, died, dies of lung cancer. <clears throat> First person says, Ah, he died of lung cancer because he smoked two packs of, of cigarettes a day from the time he was 14 years old. Mm. And the next person says, well, that's true. But the reason, the reason he, spoke, he smoked two packs of cigarettes a day was his parents were both heavy smokers. So each of them smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. And there were always cigarettes around the house, even when he was a young teenager. The other person says, ah, well, that's true. <clears throat> But the reason he, both of his parents smoked is that his, their, their grandparents smoked and, the, and they came from the old country and the old country, everybody was a smoker. So they were smoking all the time. They smoked three packs a day, four packs a day. They, they're like eating cigarettes. In fact, one of the relatives came from uh, uh, Turkey where everyone smoked uh, unfiltered cigarettes all the time. So the real cause was that, that his grandparents 
smoke cigarettes, and therefore his parents were doomed to smoke cigarettes. So the real cause was his grandparents smoking. And of course that can go on indefinitely. So the, I think one of the revolutions of the 20th century and, the, and this idea of, of experimentation was a change in focus from looking for the cause of something that exists to the effect of causes, the effect of interventions, where you can formulate the, the question and the answer in terms of actual interventions that you can do in terms of an assignment mechanism, uh, ideally a randomized assignment, so that it's unconfounded or some other. But, the, but these, other, these other questions, the effects, the uh, causes of effects of things is descriptive. I, I really think you, they, they may be hypothetical. You may be able to, 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 to think. And, and I've written about that in various places. For example, there was one discussion I wrote, I think, with the title, Which Ifs Have Causal Answers? So what kind of question that would be is, if I, if I remove the sun from the solar system, would the planets still go in their orbits? That's one of these causal like like, like questions. But the intervention of removing the sun, we have no idea what that even means. So I, I, I think it's, it's important when formulating questions in practice for things that you really want to understand uh, is you have to formulate them in the, in the context of what of, uh, interventions that you can do because then you're trying to choose uh, the intervention that's most favorable uh, to you. Does that help in any way? I hope so. So that means you have you know, come to some ideas first, then you can uh, manipulate it or intervene it to find some. Correct, and, 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 and very often so, the manip manipulation that you can do, you'll, you, you, you'll find that you want to do is you really can't do it. And then I think the focus should turn to interventions that you can do. Because if you're a practical person, why should you spend time thinking about something you can't do? Right? It's like saying, okay. ah, if I live to 2,000 years old, when I'm 1,000 years old, I will, I will start in the, the study of, uh, of, of medicine. Well, I mean, it's, it's a, so why spend time thinking about that? You're not going to live to 1,000 years old. So why, so why have a debate with other people on what you're going to do when you're 1,000 years old? It's not worth the effort. So you should you should uh, expend effort thinking about things that can be done. Maybe that's maybe that's too applied for for uh, some philosophers. But uh, it's, it's, it, I guess uh, I've I've come to the conclusion that people spend too much time worrying about things that they can't change. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, we actually have also a few questions from the audience that they okay. want to hear Ru Professor Rubin's comments. Then, then we'll first answer the audience questions and then we'll come back to discussion if we have more time. Would that okay. be fine? That's Perfect. fine. Okay, so the first question is, what's your opinion about the future development of the potential outcome framework? What's your expectation? Ah. Well, my expectation is it's the it's the correct basic framework, but there are all sorts of aspects of the real world that it hasn't been uh, uh, modified to address. Um, I because it, it, it uh, so for example uh, this uh, idea that Andrew talked about of, of precision medicine, I think is uh, is an important one because. The uh, and, and the role of, of covariates, I think, is underappreciated there, uh, because the if you do randomized experiments, one attitude used to be, you should pretty much ignore covariates. You should do large, simple, simple trials, for example. And I think that's wrong, because in order to do anything precise, what being precise means, at least to me, is to be able to uh, to condition on more and more uh, descriptors of individuals. And, and uh, so the idea there is you, you can't just do large, simple trials. And actually I'd be interested in hearing 
what, what, what Andrew has, has to say about that, because uh, certainly there's been an, an emphasis uh, in, in, in recent years on doing just large, simple experiments where you don't worry about enforcing balance on, on many covariates. It just, the simple refers to just complete randomization because the, the basic theory of Fisher and Neyman is averaging over everything. But when you actually going down to making decisions, the decisions are, have to be very conditional. Uh, uh, Andrew, what do you have to say about that? Well, I think I will probably wait because uh, because the audience probably want to hear from you. <laughs> okay. And, and now, if the time allow, I will I will see if you. Want okay. To. Fine. So, so, so this this so my basic answer is that uh, even in in design, we now have the computational tools to uh, to make designs far more precise than than can be achieved just by complete randomization, and. Uh, and an important aspect of that is this idea of re-randomization. So you look at, at zillions of possible randomized uh, allocations, and then you have measures of merit, like the difference between uh, covariate distributions in the treatment group and the control group, and you throw out all bad allocations uh, right. by, by using the computer to, to, to do that for you. And the resulting, uh, distributions that you're using are not the simple T distributions and F distributions and chi-squared distributions because the, this throwing out bad randomizations means you're truncating those distributions. And so the distributions are, are complex mixtures of truncated dis distributions, even asymptotically. And so using this general uh, uh, framework of potential outcomes, the Rubin causal model, then you can then you can try to uh, use the, the power of, of, of modern computing to do the really tedious job of throwing out bad allocations. But you first have to define bad allocations, and bad allocations will be defined in terms of covariate distributions and multivariate co covariate uh, distributions that are really tedious to compute. But that's what computers are great at doing doing these really tedious com computations. They're terrible at thinking. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the re-randomization could be a, a potential future research area. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the, the re-randomization can solve the, the bias, some bias issues. But on the other hand, they, they create uh, some difficulty in analysis because of the throughout some data and then you have to adjust for. I know you have done some work in that, but yes. I think, but when the data structure complicated, so they are going to complicate analysis further. Like if you have, let's say, non digital data, and then if you have a missing data in your outcomes, and then you have a delay in correct, uh, collect outcomes. So I, I'm kind of worried about that part to say maybe the outcome is, is, is survival time. So you yes. can't just wait until they die because that's too long so you right. and uh, but i think but the idea is i i like the idea of randomization but just need to think of both the design issue and analysis issue how to balance those two yes and and when when i think about why uh it's this re-randomization has become a more recent idea is uh, again i i said this in, briefly in in the talk i mean fisher uh, would, would would throw out a, an obviously bad randomized allocation. You know, he would he would never live with one where all the uh, uh, good plants got got a treat one treatment and all the bad plants got got the other other treatment. In fact, that's why he invented the analysis of covariance in 1935. I think he invented it. He was he had an experiment an experiment where, according to the complete randomization. Uh, the tea bushes in, in India, you know, all the, the uh, all the bushes with uh, low yield in the previous uh, year were assigned one treatment, and the ones with good yield the previous year got assigned the other treatment. And so he said, "Oh, we, we have to adjust for that using the analysis of covariance." Uh, but because he never wrote down details, actually, that's a paper where he where he he uh, made some mistakes. Not mathematical mistakes, but uh, mental mistakes, fundamental thinking about 
And I think the reason why he made those mistakes is he didn't, he wasn't using uh, Neyman's notation for these intermediate uh, potential outcomes, which he was uh, uh, saying should be adjusted for. Okay. Thank you. This is really, really helpful, especially in regards to the hot topic of real normalization recently. It's been discussed yep. a lot, so it's very helpful to hear your comments. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Deng Wu from Waseda University. Um, he was asking, now the COVID-19 pandemic is getting down worldwide. However, it is reported that the reasons for getting down are not clear enough, even for epidemiological experts. So how causal inference methods can do some more intelligence analysis in epidemiology there? <laughs> Sorry. Interesting. OK. Uh, well, I, well there, I guess there are now uh, a variety of, of vaccines uh, being, being pro, uh, proposed. And, and, the, uh, and the rules for who gets them uh, vary not only by, by, uh, by country, but with, within a country like the United States, the, uh, the rules vary by state. So the 50 states, each of them has somewhat different uh, uh, versions of, of, of that. And so I, th I think this, is, this gives an, uh, an opportunity because of, of the variety of in, in, interventions being, being proposed uh, to actually learn about and, and compare the, uh, the, the different rules. Because some of the rules have age limitations, uh, uh, you know, uh, have other rules have, you, uh, you have to have boosters with the, with the same vaccine. There's, uh, there's recent stuff in the United States, at least, that, said, that, that seems to suggest that a booster from any of the vaccines uh, works no matter what vaccine you got earlier. So there, I think there are a variety of, what, I guess, what would be called natural experiments uh, take, taking place uh, all over the, uh, the world with respect to COVID. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm certainly am, I'm not a, an expert on uh, following and uh, tracking what, uh, uh, what, 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 what these inter interventions are, but there certainly is, is a, a variety of them which leads to, I think, what would be called natural experiments where there's some, uh, uh, where the assignment mechanism is probably not that related to, out, to the assignment mechanism is not really related to potential outcomes, which is the critical assumption. I think realizing that that's the assumption, uh, that, that's, that's the critical assumption to do inference in, in natural experiments is, is, is really uh, a critical I idea to keep in mind. Thank I hope that you. answers. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the next next question from the audience is from uh, He Yong Wei. Uh, his question is, is the output set of causality included in the correlation output set or vice versa? What are the relationships? Would you read that again? That, okay. Uh, I, I think I, I, I understood the words but I may not have, have uh, understood the, the, the big idea. So read it again, please. Is the output set of causality included in the correlation output set or vice versa? What are the relationships? Output set. So I, I guess by output set, uh, that terminology is, is not familiar to me, uh, but, but the, I, I assume what it means is the, the output set meaning the the scientific conclusions that are reached at the end of a, of, of a causal analysis. Uh, is, is that how, how I should interpret that? I was wondering if it is outcome set. Oh. Is the, so the, is the outcome set me, that the, the no, phrase the, outcome it, set? I don't think it's outcome set, output set. I think okay. they're probably, this person is from computer science. So the computers think about input output. So this is the okay. output. So that means the results probably you are right down. So he, he talked about if you if I'm if I interpret correctly, <laughs> is if you do the causal inference, you get the results. And then you do the correlation analysis, you get results. How those results, uh, what's the relationship between those two results? Is that right? 
But maybe I, I suggest the, the organizer move on to the next question. So I think I say yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so if you want to rephrase that in the comments, so please do. Uh, that'd be fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be helpful. Uh, so the next question is that, do you think causal learning has the potential to be applied in more complex control problems like robotic arm control? If that, how to apply causal learning to the high dimension space? Okay, so first with respect to the uh, high, high dimensional space, I, I think that when you're dealing with, with, with a high dimensional space, the, the first thing to do is to understand Euclidean geometry. Uh, and uh, and uh, because there are many uh, sort of examples where people think that if you have a high dimensional covariance that, 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 that creates complications, well, in some sense it, it, it does. But if you look at the Euclidean space and you, and you understand eigenvectors and eigenvalues, if you, if you have a, 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 high, a high dimensional space of covariates, but only a few treatments, uh, then what, what, what happens automatically is after looking at the first principal components, there are no differences in, 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 the, in, the, in, these, in the lower principal components. So you don't have to worry about balancing things that are already balanced. So it, it, do, it doesn't create the same kind of problem as, as if you have a high dimensional outcome space, which leads to uh, like multiple comparisons problems when, 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 when trying to look at, at, at p values or significance levels. So I, um, I'm not, I, I'm, the little bit that, that I, I know about the work being, being done in, in um, sort of more of the machine learning computer science is uh, it starts with something that's not a complication. You know, so, so worrying, worrying about eigenspaces that where there's no difference. Because, uh, if 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 you have high you know if you have high dimensional covariates and you sort of ordered them you know, ranked them in importance and then you use look at the icon structure you find out in the unimportant spaces uh, uh, there are no differences now that that's because you don't have enough units but 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 still you don't have to, I mean uh, mechanically it's it's not an issue to be worried about. I hope that it addressed the question to some extent, at least. Thank you. I, I think it will be helpful for him too. Okay, so then uh, the next question is that uh, if potential outcome framework has same function in causal explainable AI with SCM, I think SC he means SCM, structural causal model. Okay. And so, uh, Read the sentence, read the question again, please. Uh, if potential outcome framework have the same function in causal explainable AI with structural causal model. Well. I think he's comparing with uh, POM with SCM. Is it structural causal model? I mean, I, I, I don't really un understand what, the, what, what those words mean. Uh, I mean, if, if, you, if you have a, the question that you're addressing formulated in terms of potential outcomes, uh, then the next step is to design a study to try to ad address that, 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 that causal question. And, and the study will, will obviously de depend upon whether it's a randomized, depending on the assignment mechanism. You know, what, uh, are, you, are you just, observing observational data, or are you actually doing uh, an experiment? And depending upon which of those you're doing, the method of, of analysis will follow from the, from the design that, that you uh, used. I basically like Bayesian models. I think Bayesian models are where everything's a random variable, are the right way to derive statistics. I think the fundamental way to do a basic analysis is to use, this, use the basic idea, the essential idea of, of Fisher doing, uh, basing it on, on the randomization distribution or a hypothetical distribution if you, if you didn't do a randomized experiment. That's the first step. And then uh, more uh, uh, complex answers are given by the, by the uh, uh, posterior distribution. 
I don't really understand all these other words that are sometimes added, like structural or graphical. I mean, those uh, those don't uh, they don't mean anything to me. So I uh, I I just I, I guess I, I view a lot of that as clutter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sort of uh, often self-serving clutter, uh, uh, which is put in in papers to just uh, for self-serving reasons. Yeah. <laughs> so names are very important when you're expressing your either the question or the theory. Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, is bad allocation cannot truly be measured by covariates? Is there a way to measure randomness beyond using big data covariates? So, so the first part of the, of the question was what, read that again. I'm not sure I understood that. Bad allocation, bad allocation right. cannot yeah. truly be measured by covariates. Okay, let me respond with a question. Why not? How, mm -hmm. else, how else would you measure it? Hmm. And he was asking, is there a way to measure randomness beyond using big data covariates? I mean, uh, I don't think so, because randomness re 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 refers to uh, a property of what you did. Mm -hmm. you, you did ra uh, random allocation, and everything's an approximation. I mean, you know, you know how, how do you draw random numbers? You know, in the old days, you took out rand table of random numbers and grabbed a, uh, a haphazard graduate student, asked him to close his eyes, turn to a page in the rand table of random numbers and put his finger down. Well, if you looked at, at which pages were, were drawn, they, a, a random page was always in the middle. It was never the first page or the last page. Similarly, they, the, uh, uh, number that was drawn on a particular page was never at the very top or the very bottom or in the very in some corner. So uh, random was always, uh, you mean, so, sort of uniform in some sense, but you, you have to describe the process by which it, it's done. And then it's a mathematical assumption that, after that. Um, yeah, so I think, that, that did, uh, I'm not sure I, I, I addressed at all the, the end of that question. Could you read the, the end again? Uh, the it has ending to do with is, correlation. Uh, the end is, is there a way to measure randomness beyond using big data covariates? No, because I'm, uh, randomness, again, is, is a property of a procedure, which, which is yes. all hypothetical. It, it's, yes. a, it's a mathematical structure. And the way there should be certain implications of a, of a mathematical process, which are mathematical, which are from covariates. I have, if I have no covariates at, at, at all, uh, how do I even assess where something looks random? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is how to understand the success of COVID-19 containment policies in relationship to public health leadership roles through causality statistics? Yeah, well, I guess uh, if this is like the, an, an earlier uh, question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because it's, it's you have um, like uh, different countries have, have, have different policies being implemented at, at different times. Uh, presumably the, uh, many of the policies uh, are not being decided based on the actual potential outcomes. So I, I, I think that the, probably the, uh, the policies and their implementation have, an, have a lot of natural experimentation in them right, right now, especially as implemented uh, where, where there's different states or, or regions of, of countries having uh, uh, modifications of policies. Okay, so this is a very similar question from the First question we responded earlier. Um, so, so, so let's go to the next question. Okay. What's, this will be the last question. What's the role of assignment mechanism in potential outcome and how to design a good RCT? Okay, so the potential outcomes are how you define the science and the covariates. So it's, it's completely uh, the potential outcomes framework 
is completely separate from the assignment mechanism, whether it's randomized or, or, or a natural experiment or completely observational. So that's that that's one I think of the of the real contributions that I, I, I made in, in the 1970s was over and over again emphasizing the distinction between the framework for defining causal effects, which is potential outcomes, and thinking about them as potential outcomes of, a, of interventions, often in uh, trying to make the interventions ones that you could possibly do. And then the assignment mechanism is what you actually did, how, what, how you implemented the interventions on uh, diff different, different units. I think one of the things that uh, I think uh, Andrew emphasized that, that's in, uh, important are these complex designs where you have um, uh, uh, nesting and, and uh, clustered randomization. And, and uh, we, we wrote several papers about those kinds of de de designs. So, but again, the, the critical first step is to think what, what you want to learn about, then formulate the, the, that, that question in, in terms of potential outcomes. And then once they're formulated in terms of potential outcomes, then think very hard about how you do an intervention or a hypothetical intervention that would yield some observed potential outcomes and some missing potential outcomes. And then my, and my own preference with it at that point would be to be build Bayesian models where you get uh, statistics, functions of, of observed data, and then at that point do inference starting with, uh, to the extent possible, to share an inference based on randomization distributions or hypothetical randomization uh, distributions and then get more, more refinement when, 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 from, from the Bayesian models and more precise uh, answers to more complex questions. Okay, uh, thank you so much for attending this event. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, I thought Professor Tui Pong earlier had a question he wanted to ask. Did Professor Tsui, do, do you want to propose your question? Do, do, do I still have a time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just want to take two minutes to echo to uh, Don's uh, question on um, how, how, how can we do intervention in the machine learning and uh, how can I do with uh, interference? in, in, in mm -hmm. our problem. Yeah, I, actually, um, this is my understanding. So the goal of the machine learning is actually just uh, to do prediction, right? And in the classic- That's my understanding is too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, in the classical setting, actually we made some uh, quite ideal hypothesis. The hypothesis is the RID, right? The sample, the, the training and testing, they are just uh, from, ident uh, from the identical distribution. Uh, so, uh, and another setting is just uh, the domain adapt uh, adaptation that, okay, we train from one distribution and we can test from uh, uh, on the other distribution, but the testing distribution should be known. So uh, either the RID, we call the RID learning or the transfer learning or domain adaptation, actually, we just uh, assume that the testing distribution is known, okay? So this is mm -hmm. a classical setting. So under this setting, actually what the machine learning model is trying to do is just to do the distribution fitting or data fitting because we know the testing distribution, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. now this is uh, actually a, a quite ideal, I mean, uh, uh, assumption because in the, real, in the real applications, we cannot assume that, okay, the testing distribution is known because there are a lot of interventions, there, there, there are a lot of uh, distribution shift in the real applications, right? Yes. So, uh, uh, so now actually, I think a very fundamental problem in the machine learning community is trying to, to relax the assumption that the testing distribution is known, okay? So if we, don't have the testing distribution, then how can we optimize the model? How can we learn the parameters? So then we need a new <laughs> paradigm for the learning. So uh, uh, I think uh, from our understanding, if we don't know the testing distribution, then we need to pursue the true model, the true model that generate the data, right? If we can, right. we, we can get a true model 
then of course, no matter how the covariance rate shift and how the distribution change, we can make a reasonable prediction, right? Correct. And, uh, and the logic is uh, if we have the true model, actually for any samples, for any sample, we can perform uniformly good, right? Because we can uh, model the true signal and only the noise cannot be modeled if we have the true model. Correct. Right? So uh, we, we just want to do a reverse engineering. That means, okay, if you change the data distribution, okay, you just change, there's a kind of intervention. For example, you can re-weight re all of the training samples to another distribution. If a model can, uh, can have, uh, I mean, uh, uniformly good performance on all of the intervened distributions. For example, you have a, a multiple re sample re-weighting strategy, right? And under each strategy, actually you can get one distribution. But across different distributions, if we can have a good, uh, I mean, a prediction performance, that means, okay, the model actually captured the true model. So uh, I think that in the machine learning, maybe one way of intervention is just as a sample re-weighting. We just intervene the distributions. And then under these distributions, whether we can find out the invariant, I mean, model or invariant structure. And this invariance, I, uh, uh, I think is somewhat related to uh, a causal effect, a causal relationship or causal structure. Uh, this is just a, our idea, but I, 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 I'm not just a very sure whether this is correct from the causal inference perspective, especially from the perspective of uh, uh, Rubin causal model. Right. Well, uh, I think what you what you mean by the uh, true causal model is the uh, true distribution of outcomes given covariates, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, when when the covariates are simple enough, let's say just define a few uh, strata, uh, then we we weighting works. Mm -hmm. uh, but if if there is uh, if the covariates are are complex or complicated. I don't want to even use complex in the in the uh, mathematical sense. Uh, it, it, but if if they're complicated and you have many outcome variables, I think you you have to rely on modeling the why the outcome given the covariates and 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 the modeling can uh, and then what you do if you because if, if you have a, a good model for outcomes given covariates for y given x. Then you you can predict y at lots of different x values, mm -hmm. uh, and I and I think that that's the the uh, uh, bigger picture. Whereas weighting uh, is uh, you have to, you have to have the, the continuous version of weighting to to, to have the general idea uh, yeah. uh, correctly formulated. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I I think we're, we're we're saying the same thing, basically. Yeah. Al yeah. Although the words may be slightly different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but there has been um, uh, work done starting in the probably mid 1930s uh, mm -hmm. in, in survey work. Uh, I think the, probably the, the work that's uh, closest to, to the work that, uh, that you're talking about in computer science is probably the work on missing data. Because mm -hmm. here uh, you, you, you'd worry about if the, if the, if the guys who are who are missing have very different covariate values, you know that you're relying on extrapolation. You're relying more and more on some hypothetical model. Mm -hmm. And the weighting, the idea of just, just weighting units only works when the support for the data are the same for the people who are observed and the people who are missing. Or otherwise yeah. the, the imputation of, of the missing data won't be very good. So uh, in fact, there were, uh, there was a, a three-volume collection of, of, of books that were published around, I think, 1984 or three uh, by the, uh, uh, under the National Academy of Sciences because there was a committee on, on, on handling uh, missing data. And the, uh, uh, there are various authors uh, to, the, to the three volumes. I think I'm, on, I'm one of the co-authors on, on one of the volumes but a guy named William Maddow, 
M A D O W, with mm -hmm. author on all. And I think it's an action because it's really a problem you're discussing right now, except it was done in the context of, of uh, large US surveys mostly. Medical examination survey with 20 or 30,000 people. And, they, and because this, this was a design survey, it had certain structures that it, like it had the, uh, different sampling units for states and it has a hierarchical level to it. So that, that, that literature, I think, is, is quite relevant, although not the techniques that are being used, because again, the, the techniques are far more simple minded than the ones that can be used today. Uh, but I, I think it, 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 it's, it's worth looking at so it's historical interest, and there probably are, are, are a variety of, of interesting ideas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is very uh, constructive comments and inspiring. But uh, I, just, just now, the, the signal is not very good, so I will write an email to you, and uh, could you okay, please fine. send the survey title to me? And I will Fine, that. I will do so. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Thank you so much. So uh, it's actually getting very late, almost like 11, 18 in China. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I know you, are, you need time to grab lunch as well. Yes. So thank you so much for, uh, for the wonderful, wonderful talk that we're very, very honored and very lucky to have you here tonight. And thank you all for the speakers, because I was reading the comments from uh, the Billy Billy, because this room is full. So we have a lot of um, outside broadcasting guests from the website of Billy Billy, and they were commenting on how useful and how helpful those uh, response are. So I guess they contribute a lot to the uh, knowledge and we are very, very happy and learned a lot tonight. Um, right. I, I really ap appreciated the, the formal discussions and the informal questions. I think uh, <laughs> they were very helpful generally for trying to clarify the, these important ideas. Thanks again for the invitation. Okay, so uh, last section, I'm gonna uh, give a brief introduction about uh, Professor Don's book. One second, my... Okay. Here's what happens every single time I try to share something on my screen. Oh, Don, I have to say goodbye because uh, I have a meeting tomorrow where I talk. Okay. Okay, yeah, you have to get up. You, or hope say back back in China. I hope I hope so too, <laughs> Andrew. Okay, bye bye. Good seeing you again. Bye bye. Okay, yeah, let's... bye bye. Okay, so can everybody see my screen? Um, no. I can't see your screen. I can see yeah. your face. <laughs> you can't see me in my screen. <laughs> I can't. I can see your face, but I can't see see your screen. You can't see my screen. What happened? Nope. Okay, let's try again. That's what happens every single time I try to share something. Okay, I see it. Yeah, it, it comes. Yes, yeah, there's a very long time of uh, lag, time lag. Oh, it's okay. jet lagged. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, this, well, the speed of light is only so fast. Okay, yes. Depending upon um, how many circuits it has to go through, even the speed I, of light can take time. <laughs> I know, we need to take more time. Um, okay, so I'm going to finish this really fast. Uh, we are going to read Professor Donna Rubin's book on causal inference for statistics, social and biomedical sciences, the end introduction. This will be a, uh, this is a very classical book to learn about causal inference. So the reading club will start uh, next Sunday, every morning, uh, every week. And then we will going to have uh, students and also scholars sharing the contents of each chapter every single week. Uh, and then we are also having the coding session to help to replicate the studies in the book. So uh, on the right is the QR code. So if you're interested, please register through the QR code on the right. And again, thank you very much for Ruby. 我们后续呢会针对Rubin这本书有一个读书会 OK, so that's all for tonight.
Thank you so much. Stay safe and have a good day. Thank you very much. And again, thank you so thanks much, for the invitation. Professor Ruby. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. 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 Have a good night.